Good evening, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the Dallas Free Lecture Series. And on behalf of uh, D2 Counseling and Unity Dallas, we welcome you to the Dallas Free Lecture Series. This series started a, couple, a few years back, um, and we have continued it on uh, in conjunction with Unity Church. And we're so privileged that they have been able to partner with us on this so that we can bring a variety of topics to you and uh, meet the needs of what the community has asked for. Uh, we went to Zoom back when COVID hit a year, year and a half ago, and we are pleased that y'all are with us tonight. This is the very first one that we have decided to live stream, and so the live part is what we're most happy about. So give yourself some applause for being here. We appreciate the attendance tonight, and we look forward to in-person attendance improving or, uh, excuse me, increasing as we go and we welcome you all tonight back to the event. With that, I'd like to introduce my uh, business partner, co-founder of D2 Counseling, Dr. Dina Hijazi. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Dina Hijazi. It's so good to have you here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being our first um, returners, returners. This is exciting. So from here on out, we will be doing the hybrid of live and the um, live, stream. live stream on Facebook, Unity Facebook. I want to just take a moment and tell you who we are. We're D2 Counseling. The D2 is Daniel and Dina. And we came together to put, uh, we wanted to put a group of therapists together that were like-minded, that are um, experienced, seasoned therapists where we could have a environment that was collaborative and creative. And we've got a wonderful group. Two of um, the therapists are with us tonight and they'll be presenting. And um, hopefully you'll get a chance to meet the others too as this year goes on. Um, we offer a lot of groups. We wanna tell you about some of those. We have a couples group we have um, 10 other groups that meet weekly. We're huge proponents of the group process because we really believe that we learn best with our peers. So if any of you have any interest in, in um, either coming to a group or have friends that are interested, just give us a call. We've got two things we wanna bring your attention to. This flyer that's out front that is um, called Living with OCD. It's a support group that's facilitated by one of our therapists who is an OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder therapist, and she is a specialist in that area. The second goes along with tonight, and um, you might want to say a little bit more. Um, the smooth sailing workshop is for, uh, it's going to be a workshop it's already sold out. The first one they're doing is second one where it's parents with young adults. So it fits right with this conversation tonight. And I'll just ask you to say a little bit more when you come on stage. So we are always available to offer CEUs for these events. Uh, if you're here in person, uh, make sure that you register and uh, we'll have a CEU for you at the end of the, or CEU certificate at the end of the presentation. If you're watching on the live stream, if you would send us an email at kerrigan at D2 Counseling, we can provide CEUs in that fashion as well. Next month's speaker is, will be on August 17th, and we have Reverend Paul Burns, and his topic is Rethinking Your Attachments, A Step Towards Greater Spiritual Health. And Paul is a great speaker, and his material is really unique. He did his PhD on spiritual assessment, and he came up with uh, one of the first tools used to help people address where their spirituality is. It quantifies it, and it's a hugely useful tool for people who are trying to figure out where the level of growth is, either with themselves or with others. And he's going to speak into that, and I'm really excited about hearing him speak on that. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carrie and Carrie, and we look forward to hearing your introduction and then your presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Reverend Carrie Duholm. I am a licensed professional counselor with our D2 Counseling Group in Dallas. I specialize in kids and couples and compassion fatigue. I also help people who are going through transitions, 
uh, especially spiritual issues and relationship addiction. I've worked as a counselor for seven years, and prior to that, I was a pastor for a decade in the city and suburbs around Chicago. I have additional training in EMDR and trauma, as well as counseling with children as young as three years old. Uh, it's a great pleasure to me that I get to speak often in churches to groups of police officers and parent-teacher organizations, and I'm proud to be a continuing, sorry, contributing author of the book, When Kids Ask Hard Questions, Faith Field Responses to Tough Topics. I have four children of my own, one of whom has joined our family from foster care. It's a pleasure to speak with you today, and I just wanted to review our learning objectives. Participants will learn about important topics for parents and young adults to discuss. Participants will learn about transitioning from parent-child roles to coach-player roles as the young adult leaves the home. And participants will learn about roles in a relationship, how to strengthen the relationship through intentional roles and communication. Um, our time together tonight will help those of us who care for young adults explore how the roles and relationships change as those young adults leave the house and transition to independence. Healthy communication, clear roles, and knowing when to ask for help and when to offer will be discussed. If you like our talk, we hope you will, and if you would like to hear more, please join us for our workshop, which is um, on the same topic on July 31st. There's flyers in the entryway with more information. We're very happy to talk with you about it. You can also find out more information on the D2 counseling website or our Facebook page. And that workshop is intended for parents and children who are transitioning into adulthood to come together. Um, we would love to have you, and an RSVP is required. So when I went to college, back in the dark ages, when the internet was a baby and cell phones came with a small suitcase attached, the world was pretty different. What was possible in terms of communication was different. The roles parents played in their children's lives was different by necessity. We used to have free run of the neighborhood on our bikes. We'd be gone for hours without checking in, except for Mrs. Williams down the street, who always seemed to be watering her lawn, watching out for whippersnappers and reporting back to our parents. We didn't take selfies of our activities or our food. We didn't TikTok or snap people or use any of these new medias. And I do want to say that I think social media can be helpful to people, that it has a lot to offer if used well. But it's just different than what we had when we were kids. When my husband was dropped off for college, he didn't talk to his parents for two weeks. They weren't even concerned, and they liked him. So here we are today with our current reality, seeking to help our kids navigate these new challenges, plus the old ones. And Carrie is going to talk about some specific scenarios that may come up for you in her section, so I'm gonna leave that for a little bit. You probably heard some negative terms for the way some parents act. Helicopter parents, snowplow parents, enmeshed, bad boundaries, no boundaries. You've probably known some parents who struggle with letting their children have independence. And I'm sure we all know young people who have moved back home after college or starting a career. I have some friends who teach at the college level who have shared some of their challenges as professors with parents who struggle with the difference between high school and college, like parents who email their child's teacher about grades or extra work, or parents who track the cell phone of their child to see what they're doing. Because of social media, we can just see a lot more of our children's lives if they choose to share. And so this is messy. This stuff is messy. And it forces us to ask ourselves some big questions. Who are we to our kids now? What do our kids need? And also, what do we want as the adults, as the parents? When I was getting ready to choose between colleges, I lived in a suburb of Kansas City, and I was trying to decide between a school in Texas or a school about an hour away from our family home. 
and I said to my parents I was concerned about choosing the local school because they would probably come and visit me every weekend when I was in college. And they laughed so long and so hard that I was concerned for them. It turned out that wasn't actually their plan to visit me every weekend, and that was where I went to school, so rock chalk Jayhawk. I had a wonderful roommate my freshman year of high school, of college, and when we showed up on the first day, she had come with her mother and her sister, and I had come with both my parents. And we were setting up our room. We had a small room, remember, it was the dark ages. And she pulled out a bag that had her sheets in it, and her sister and mother looked at her aghast, and her mother said, did you wash those sheets? And she looked flabbergasted, I tried not to act confused, too, because I didn't know what the issue was. And her sister said, make sure you sleep with the window shut because you're going to slide right off those. She didn't know that you needed to wash sheets before you slept on them, that there's all that whatnot on them. So her mother thought she was OK, that she had communicated what she needed to know to launch into her freshman year of college. But there was still that hole in communication. We can still. Um, strive for clear roles and clear communication. Have any of you read the book? It's a children's book, I Love You Forever. Yes, great book, good. Uh, beautiful story, beautiful um, book, favorite of mine growing up. It's a story of a mom and her son, and it goes through his lifetime. When he's little, she's rocking him and singing him a lullaby. I'll love you forever, I'm not going to sing. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Even when he's a messy toddler, she rocks him to sleep with that lullaby. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Even when he's a rebellious teen, she sneaks into his room and sings to him that she will love him forever. And then he moves across town to his own home, and in the middle of the night, she drives across town with a ladder strapped to her station wagon to climb up the window of his home to rock him to sleep, saying, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. When the mom becomes quite old and fragile, the young man, who's a middle-aged man, drives to her house, he rocks her, and he sings the same thing to her. I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mama you'll be. And to be clear, I love this book, but also it gets a little enmeshed in the middle, right? We're not recommending that you drive across town, scale your kid's home or dorm room with a ladder to rock them in the night, but it does show a really nice example of the transition in the role, where the child eventually takes over nurturing the parent. Roles in a relationship are most healthy when they are clear. And to understand what is possible in relationships, it's good to know a little bit about personality development and developmental, developmental psychology. Yes, I promise it is. So forgive me a little bit as I geek out here. The highly regarded psychologist Eric Erickson was a pioneer in the field of developmental psychology, and he wrote in the late 1950s and 60s. His crucial theory states that there are eight stages of development, each with a conflict to resolve and a moral dilemma that should be solved before the child or adult moves to the next stage. When someone is roughly 12 to 18 years old, they go through the fifth of these stages, which he called identity versus role confusion. Basically, this stage includes discovering a sense of self, a personal identity, trying on roles, a brand, if you will, different beliefs, setting goals for themselves. It's one explanation for why teenagers have so many questions, why they think their parents are dummies, and why they seem to reinvent themselves over and over. It's a good thing. It's a necessary thing as they begin to separate from their family of origin and find themselves as an independent, hopefully competent adult. 
Following that stage is what Erickson called intimacy versus isolation. And he posited that this stage took place between 18 and 40 years old. The task of this stage is to form intimate, loving relationships with other people, including outside of the family. The stage will also include examining one's identity and will expand to questions of who am I? Am I part of this group or that group? This time generally includes moving out of the house or at least changing relationships within the house, maybe formalizing a long-term relationship, having children, starting a career. And all of these parts of a person's life include roles. The role of mother, wife, employee, person, member of a faith community, a member of this friend group or this social group. And learning how to negotiate those roles can require a continual re-examining. Erickson said that successful completion of this stage will give the person happy relationships and a sense of safety, love, and commitment in those relationships. If we're able to move through that stage with grace and problem-solving support, we can grow in our abilities, in our capacities, and become more resilient for the tasks of adulthood. So given what we know about the brain and how personality develops over time, we can continue to change how we relate to our children in ways that positively help them. When our children are young, our role is to be protector, teacher, form filler outer, role models. As they get older, moving into their middle teen years, we become killjoys, lamos with a few good ideas. Maybe that's just my house. Carpool coordinators, role models again, and hopefully confidants. And in the late teen years, we should move into being coaches and cheerleaders, being mentors and sounding boards. This time requires us to step back and deal with the possibility that our young person might fail and that it might be the kind of failure that is very hard to get past. Or we deal with the possibility that they might succeed past our wildest dreams, form a life that serves them well and contributes to the greater society, making all of us better. Moving to a coach role means that we have to trust that they will do the work they need to do and that all the work we have put into them is sufficient. And that requires us to trust ourselves. Have I taught my children to wash their sheets before sleeping on them? Have we taught them how to change a flat tire, how to scramble eggs properly, call grandma on her birthday, or how to talk politely to people in authority, or, or, or? Just like we shouldn't should all over the place, the ors can create a sense of helplessness in our kids. We have to trust them to figure it out, even when it's messy, and they may need to call us in for help later. Kelly Williams Brown writes in her book, Adulting, how to be a grown-up in 468-ish steps of several ways to think about this transformation into adulthood. And the audience of her book is young people. A few helpful steps she includes. Bring as much grace to bear as you can when you, you interact with your parents. When we can assume that someone is talking with us with good intentions, it can help smooth over a multitude of possible bad interactions. Using curiosity when it seems like there might be a conflict and much communication, miscommunication, can be reduced or repaired. She advises, remember that you're the one who's changed, not them, and the burden of proving that growth is on you. Now this advice, I think, goes both ways. We need to recognize the way in which both sides of the relationship have changed and celebrate the possibilities from that. 
Conversely, she writes, understand that as much as they want it for you, they also may need to mourn your independence a little bit. This one we get to practice with our kids throughout their childhood. For example, my eldest child is taller than me now. That was pretty weird. And there's a million more ways in which he will become independent before and after he leaves our home. Kelly also writes, be aware of what it means to them, to the parents, to be an adult. Then highlight those elements of your life as proof you are a grown up. That gives us the opportunity to look for ways to celebrate the successes of our children. My brother and I still text our parents when we get our teeth cleaned. It started for genuine affirmation, we're very dorky, and positive feedback, and also to show them that we are taking care of something that's very important to them. And also, it's just funny at this point. And lastly, she says, get to know your parents as people. This is one of the best things about kids getting older. They get to learn that we adults are actual humans with real interests and a real life, and we get to meet them and learn about them as they grow and change. As children become adults and grow in independence, boundaries need to be re-examined and negotiated. Boundaries is one of those words that is in our current lexicon. People are using it all the time. And like words that get used all the time, it's starting to get a fuzzy meaning. So I would like to define it as expectations. Carrie has a lot more to say about this in a minute. So briefly, I'll just say that boundaries are part of a Venn diagram that overlap. The things that we want, the things that they want, and the space where both happen. And lastly, I'd like to recommend a book about boundaries called Set Boundaries, Find Peace by Nedra Tawab. Thank you. Hi, it's so lovely to be here with you. Um, I was super excited to do this presentation um, and have this opportunity to speak with you about parenting and helping you adjust to the next to the role of, um, of parenting your adult children and college age children. Um, I have my husband and I have seven children together, and I have already sent three kids off to college, and my fourth one is going off in three weeks. I began my, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I began my career as a social worker working with parents and children in foster care. I created a nonprofit agency when I lived in North Dakota, matching um, mothers in the community with young mothers or mothers with a low IQ and helping them increase their parenting skills. I was the director of an adolescent unit for over 10 years at two different behavioral health hospitals. Uh, as well as the outpatient, intensive outpatient treatment program at, there. I am blessed to be a part of D2, where I specialize in marriage therapy. I am a Gottman-trained marriage therapist. Um, I also work with adults who seek guidance with establishing boundaries and relationships with their children of all ages, including young adults. I love parent coaching and um, I think one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it is because I definitely can identify. I think, um, you know, being able to connect with them, we've all been at that point. I have extensive experience providing counseling to adolescents and young adults as well, helping them create connections, establish re healthy relationships, improve their executive functioning skills, and work through boundaries with their parents. I facilitate a group therapy held on Mondays for young adults ages 18 to 24, um, helping them talk about uh, their experiences in college, dating, boundaries within parents. Some of the young adults in the group um, live at home. Some of them are in college. Some of them are trying to figure out how to do life without going to college.
As I said, the topic of um, learning how to parent your child through their second stage of life is something that I both researched and explored as a clinician and I personally experienced. My four oldest children are 26, 24-year-old twins, and 18. My three oldest children have attended college, completed their degrees, and are now successfully living independent lives. Super proud of that. <laughs> My youngest daughter um, is going to be going to Texas Women's University, and we drop her off on August 16th. Helping parents navigate through the challenges and leaning into the joys of parenting is something that both Carrie and I are really passionate about. I'm excited to have this opportunity to share research and helpful information that will assist in parents in helping their child transition to college. My section of this um, lecture is going to be giving some um, tips and advice in going through some scenarios, real life scenarios. Um, I, some of this was gathered through um, research um, and learning information from different collegiate um, experts as well as psychologists. The public schools in Texas introduce students to college prep beginning in, the, in middle school, selecting the classes that they'll take to help prepare them for high school. The grades your child earns each semester throughout the high school do have value. However, the grades on your students' transcripts their junior year of college is often the grades that the colleges will be reviewing when they're going through the admission process. While college talk should ramp up the junior year of high school, parents and students find that most of the legwork and effort in the beginning of the transition to independence really takes place or is very pronounced their senior year of high school. Seniors in high school have several options to consider when they graduate from high school. In my clinical practice, I often hear young adults express frustration um, that they have to go to college or that they really don't want to go to college. They have no choice. Their parents are forcing them to go to college. Whenever we uh, come across that, I remind them that they are now an adult. They have a choice in virtually every single decision that they make. This is a very different role and one that they're not used to. As a clinician, my goal is to empower others to see that they can advocate for themselves, look at all the options, and make the decision that is most likely to have the results that they want. They're not ever forced to do something that they don't want to do, but they do need to be aware of the path that their decision leads them down. As a parent, I found this approach very helpful. I remember multiple times, one son in particular was very frustrated and found it daunting when he had, when I asked him and encouraged him and guided him in gathering information about different colleges. I often would hear him say, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't even want to go to college anyways. Of course, as a parent, that just just made me hold my breath sometimes because my fear was maybe he won't decide to go to college. Instead, I just walked this through with him. At that time, he was super, super lucky to be making $10 an hour working at a bowling alley. And we talked about the budget and what it would look like. He didn't have to go to college. That was an option. But what will your life be like and what will you be able to afford working, making $400 a week? Dr. McConville, the author of Failure to Launch, suggests that parents teach their children they have four options after graduation. And staying home, not working, and not going to school is not one of the options. Their young adult can work full time, and that of course has firm boundaries about how long they'll live at home and how much financial assistance they'll receive from the family. They can join the military. They can attend a junior college, which is oftentimes a good choice for students who have poor executive functioning skills, um, ones that really struggled with study skills and time management there towards the end of their school year, um, or students who just want to start taking the Texas core classes before they attend a four-year university. Um, 
as long as, as well as in the junior college, there's lots of options to attend different trade schools. And of course, they also have the option of attending a four-year university. For the purpose of this lecture, I'm gonna focus on helping parents transition their child to a four-year university. In my personal journey of becoming a parent of a college student, the 18 months of the senior year through the start of their college was actually the most challenging time in parenthood. I loved babies. Taking care of babies came really easy to me. I loved to play the preschool years. I really can't recall any other time during the childhood that I myself had to grow as much as I did during the time of my child being a senior. I had to remain self-disciplined, practice stress management, juggle conflicting schedules, learn totally new processes, do research on schools, receive an incredible amount of information second-handedly through my kids, relearn how to parent, redefine and uphold new boundaries, all while feeling quite nostalgic and grieving over my old role as a parent of a dependent child. This was the first time during the 18 year relationship with my child where I couldn't say, don't worry, just follow my lead, do as I say, I got this. That was really, really hard for me. And to be honest, I quite enjoyed being able to listen to what my child wanted, consider options, but know that I always had the ability to make the final decision on something important. Those days were gone and I really struggled with that change. Some of the tips that can help significantly during the senior year um, that, that has helped many families that I've worked with, especially as I have worked with parent coaching. Number one, frequent short conversations about college. Asking them questions like, where would you like to go to school? How far from home do you wanna live? What do you think college will be like? What size of classes do you like? And what environment do you think you learn best? Would you want to go to a larger school or smaller school? As we're asking these, these questions to our kids, I often in my mind thought, that's ridiculous. You're not going to go to school on the East Coast. What about traveling back and forth? I can't afford to pay for a private school. Those thoughts had to go to the side and just continue to explore, not restrict them, allow them to dream, and then we can take that into some realistic chunks. The second one is to create a college comparison spreadsheet. This was actually a thought I had with my oldest son he made me carry the tradition on down for my other children because if he had to suffer through this, so did everyone else. Even though he had this really awesome spreadsheet that he finished at the end. Just really helping a senior in high school create an Excel spreadsheet alone is pretty painful. Some of the things that we listed on this comparison spreadsheet was the tuition, the cost of housing, meal plans, distance from home, travel expenses, whether there was fraternity or sororities, um, the majors that they were offered, the class size. This was a really invaluable learning experience and tool and something that we definitely reflected on and helped us to narrow down what would be a best option. The third one is to talk about the college expense. This is something that um, I often, hear, it, it still boggles my mind, I often hear um, adolescents that I'm working with, they're a junior in high school, and they literally have not had this conversation with the parents. I don't know if that's because I was constantly in the thought of, oh my gosh, how can I afford college? But it, it really surprises me that this is a, not always a conversation that starts really young. I clearly remember my parents um, setting up a bank account for me when I was in kindergarten. 
Now, I'm from Alaska, and so in Alaska, we got the state dividend fund. So not many students, not many kids earn $1,600 a year just for living in the state that they live in. So that was a really nice chunk and way to save and constantly remind me throughout my childhood that this money is going to be going for college and I was paying for it. Talking about the college expense uh, is important, trying to discover who's going to be, who's going to pay for it. Um, how much is the child going to be contributing? Are the parents asking the child or is the child going to be taking on um, uh, student loans? What about any scholarships? Scholarship, thinking about scholarships really needs to start probably when they're in middle school because there's so many things with the scholarships such as um, being involved in their community and volunteering that are going to need to be built up as they're applying for scholarships. Uh, one of the most helpful tools that I can suggest in preparing your senior is to use a Google Calendar or another calendar app that can be shared amongst other people um, as a communication tool. I found this to be a lifesaver. There was so much going on in my house. I had several teens working at the same time, different jobs, different schedules, different deadlines to meet. In addition, in addition to my own work life, there was no way that I could remember all of the kids' activities. I also did not have the time or the desire to list all of those activities on the calendar. Desperation drives innovation. By the time my children were able to drive and have a job, I added them to the family calendar that we used to keep track. My kids were responsible for listing their work schedule, sports activities, deadlines during their senior year. I would add to the calendar when I scheduled them a doctor's appointment, when the, my child and I talked about having a special outing together, or um, you know, if, if they needed me to take them shopping one day to buy cleats, then um, they would add it to the calendar, reminding me I needed to do that. It's also really important that parents understand the application process and be aware of the deadlines, course requirements for college. Core requirements such as the ACT, SAT, transferring credits from junior colleges or AP courses. This is something that your child will be should be uh, handling independently, but it's really important that parents know this so that they can guide them. The last tip that was suggested was um, creating or finding a senior life skills checklist. Creating goals and using teachable moments throughout the year. Under some of the main categories on this senior's life skills checklist, uh, there will also be specifics that might need to be broken down. Julie Lithcott, a former dean of Stanford University, teaches that there are four steps to teaching our child a skill. You do it for them, you do it with them, you watch them do it, and they do it on their own. Once your child has demonstrated the ability to perform some of these skills, allow them to continue to manage this area themselves while you're there to support and answer any questions. Some of these life skills might be laundry, to include, do you know how to iron? Cooking, sauteing meat, um, finances, using a budget, how to open a bank account, learning about credit cards, car maintenance and transportation, time management, personal health, making your own doctor's appointments, um, when to know when to go to a doctor, uh, taking medication, keeping their personal space clean, professionalism, introducing yourself to adults, and having um, learning email etiquette, which is very different than texting. What is your primary goal or greatest desire for your child? This is often a go-to question that I will ask during therapy with, when I'm doing therapy with parents and adolescents. The answers are usually some sort 
of for them to be a successful, happy, independent adult. When I ask adolescents a similar question, what do you think your parents' primary job is? They surprisingly, unanimously answer the same thing for me to be a happy, independent person. So how do we help our child to grow up to be successful, happy, and independent adult? By providing a safe place to learn, encouragement, validation, and autonomy to do for themselves what they are capable of doing. The negative effects of overparenting children are well documented. Research shows that it can lead to psychological distress, narcissism, poor adjustment, anxiety, substance abuse, and a host of other behavioral problems in young adults. When we do too much for our kids, when we overfunction for them, we rob them of the skills and practice necessary to develop competence and mastery in life. Instead of learning life skills, they develop a problem that psychologists refer to as learned helplessness, which is thought to be a major contributing factor toward, to depression, lack of motivation, and anxiety. Responsibilities, positive and negative consequences, and accountability. Chores, responsibilities, and facing uncomfortable or new situations are an opportunity to be successful and a major contributing factor to a child's self-worth. I thought it would be helpful to, um, to talk about some of the do's and don'ts as you transition from the place of being a manager or advisor for your child into being a coach, coaching them through college. This is an important time for both of you, as I had talked before, um, so much growth in the parent as well as growth in the child. Um, we're really doing things differently. You're learning to reparent. You're not being able to parent the same way. First one is don't decide what they should major in. I also struggled with this because up until last year, my daughter, who is super outdoorsy and a nature lover and really good with animals, wanted to be major in forestry. Of course, my mind is dinging and I'm thinking, how much money are you going to make majoring in forestry? Giving them that ability to decide what they want to do is really important for them. They're often going to change their mind several times. Instead, help provide them information, resources on careers, and give them the freedom to change their mind. I don't know how many parents um, are aware of FERPA. FERPA is a federal leg legislation that is similar to HIPAA, but for the educa education sector. Why do I know this? Because last year when my daughter was in junior college, I tried to contact one of her professors. A little bit embarrassing to say that. However, the reason why was because she was having surgery. And so I really wanted to make sure that she was on top of all of her assignments and had everything. So I did have anesthesia and recovering from the surgery as the excuse for calling the professor, but that is when I learned about FERPA. Don't call any of the professors, the school staff, or check on your child's grades. This is a big transition. We're not using student portals anymore, where you're able to, five times a day, Find out what assignments your child has turned in, what their grade is in the class. It's really important that your child is able to take ownership in that, to learn, oh my gosh, I kind of dwaddled the first few weeks of school and now midterms are actually in two weeks. How is that even possible? Instead, ask your students, ask your children what their classes are. Know what their class schedule is. Be aware of those small, intimate details 
know that they have their English class um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Typically in English 101, they're reading one particular book and they stay with that book for research throughout the whole semester. What is that book? Maybe even get the book yourself. Um, become interested in that. Have those discussions with your kids if they actually really want to talk to you about it. Um, I remember my father, this, this memory came to me when I was thinking about this lecture. My dad used to always tell me, those professors work for you, Carrie. Make them earn their money. And I thought, my gosh, I mean, I, okay, really at the time I thought, oh, whatever, dad, just whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't really know what to make of that. And it came to me as I was thinking about this and that I also had said the same thing to my child, except I was telling them that their doctor worked for them. <laughs> my, the meaning behind that is get the most you can, juice that orange. Uh, you know, go to their office hours. Their office hours are there for a reason. Um, ask questions. Um, you know, using that self-advocacy, um, you know, using those resources. We pay a lot of money on college fees for the learning center and for those other areas that the students really need to be able to access. Don't invade their space by calling them daily, tracking them on their phone, and telling them who they should date, or become angry if they stay out late at night. Mm, this is actually another learning moment I had. <laughs> very, very innocently, when my first son went to college, dropped him off at the dorm, maybe two days later, I just was thinking of him. I wanted to know, is he in the student union having breakfast right now? I was trying to envision what his day was like. I don't think it was Life 360 back then, but I did have some sort of app similar to that. So Saturday morning at 8.30 in the morning, I pulled up on the app to see where he was. He was in Arlington. He was going to school in Denton. I was flabbergasted. I, I didn't even know what to say. Fortunately, I had the good sense to not immediately text him, and it quickly connected for me that his high school girlfriend was going to UTA. Don't ask questions that you don't want to know. <laughs> Have open conversations with your children about safety, boundaries, safe sex. Ask them if they've gone to the store and bought condoms before. Help them talk about, you know, talk with them about some of those things that are really kind of cringy to talk to them about. Many times they might say, Mom, that's too cringy. I can't do this with you. Open up the conversation in casual ways. Keep them short and brief and in during those teachable moments. Um, I also highly recommend reinforcing to your children that you will be there if there's a car accident or if something major happens, but legal consequences, they're on their own. That doesn't mean you're driving over to help them out if they're, I don't, my, my daughter's going away in three weeks. I don't even want my brain to go about all of the things that can't happen actually. <laughs> don't leave the money talk to right before they go to college. I also really recommend not giving your child a credit card with who knows what kind of a balance on it, or I mean credit limit on it. Um, but it's really important that families, different lifestyles, different values, different ways that you handle money, families are able to think about all of the options and decide for themselves what would work best as far as giving your child spending money and what that budget would look like. Create a budget with them. Allow your child to manage it, preferably before they go off to college. Talk about the financial contribution that they're going to make during college. Encourage them to get a job um, or 
allow them, if they receive a certain amount in scholarship, that that's their pay towards college. Don't ask them if they're homesick or if they miss you. Don't repeatedly tell them that you miss them. Of course you miss them. Of course they miss you as well. I can't think of any answer to this question that would actually have give you warm feelings. So if you're asking your child if they're homesick and they say, loving it here, haven't thought of you, that's not really the answer you want. But then if they're also saying, yes, they're homesick, they miss you, they want to come home, they're really struggling, then how are you going to answer, with, answer if they say that they are homesick? So encourage them to become involved on campus, to join organizations. This is one of the most recommended um, bits of advice that, um, that college officials will talk about through um, orientations is have your child become involved. Have them feel that school spirit and have that sense of unity there. Attend the family weekend at the college, if at all possible, and remain connected with them. But allow them to take the lead on how often and what kind of communication they want to have. If it doesn't work for you, if you feel like we're not talking to each other enough, I'm really missing you and I just want you to check in with me, then that can be a conversation to have in a couple months after they start to get settled and you're both able to share how you feel that it's working out. Unsolicited advice. If it is negative, your child is going to hear that as criticism. Help your child to problem solve, ask open questions, and recall by help them to problem solve by asking open questions. Many times I think that it's helpful if you were to recall some of the mistakes or some of the bumps in the road that you had when you were first trying to establish your independence. That helps you to have empathy and a little more understanding when your child does something that you are just thinking, what is up with your head? Um, I will admit, um, do any of you guys remember the BMG Music Club? where you got eight CDs for a penny? Well, for some reason, by the end of my first semester, I owed that $500. It was embarrassing, I was in a muddle, I didn't know what to do, and I kept getting these stupid Kenny Rogers CDs. <laughs> I learned a new term um, called soiling the nest. I'd never heard of that before, but it seems so fitting when we're also talking about empty nest. As it is in with most families, the summer before my children left for college was always an upheaval in the home. They frequently shut down, pulled away, wanted to spend more time with their friends, became irritable, resistant, very resistant to helping around the house. They could be really mean to their siblings, speak disrespectfully to the adults, and I really had a difficult time predicting when this was going to arise. There were also snippets of time that they would be extra clingy, wanting to cuddle with me on the couch, um, ask for my opinion, frustrated when I was unavailable to help them immediately, frustrated when I wouldn't give them my opinion and I asked them questions instead. My kids really wanted to be close to me during certain pockets of time. This is soiling the nest is a common phrase before children go off to college. It's a term that describes a way that a teen acts in the weeks or the months leading up to college. A teenager's job is to become independent. When it's time to go, there can be really mixed feelings about that. They want to go, they don't want to go. They love you, they hate you. They'll miss you, they hate themselves for missing you. They hate themselves for being scared to go. It's a super confusing time. Just as you begin to prepare your child for college, parents also need to 
have more understanding and recognize that this isn't a personal, this really isn't about the wet towels on the bathroom floor or the unpacked swim bag from two weeks ago. It's about your child is having lots of different feelings, emotions, and experiences that they are very new to them. <clears throat> I lastly wanted to speak about um, things that you can do for yourself, for your own time, after your child has left the house. Um, taking some time to prepare for that and imagine what life is going to be like when your child is gone is painful for some people, but it will be really helpful to help you to plan. Recognize and identify your emotions, that it's okay to feel sad and nostalgic, missing your child, that you're excited for them. Even a sense of relief, depending on the degree of soiling the nest that you just experienced. <clears throat> Recognize that the family dynamics change. This also came as a surprise to me when my first son left. Um, I admittedly just thought about how much I was going to miss him, how much, you know, that my first one was going away, and, and really how I was going to deal with that. I didn't really recognize how much my, there, his siblings were going to miss him. His brother and sisters were really sad. They really missed him. They didn't have someone <clears throat> home with them after school when they came home. They didn't have their confidant and their brother to get used firecrackers and, you know, try to test out what would happen if you put two ends of an electrical cord together and just all of that stuff that they did. <coughs> Talk as a family about um, a trip you might take or something special you might do together. Recognize the way that you're child helped out in the family and adjustments that need to be made. I do not recommend taking his chore list and dividing it up quickly amongst the other kids. <laughs> Recognize what you're going to do to prepare the, uh, fill the extra time now that your child is gone. Hopefully you've already brainstormed some new hobbies, Bible studies you want to become involved with. Evaluate if this is a good time to start advancing in your career or even returning to college yourself. Plan a project around your house. If possible, connect with other parents of college students. And uh, you know, there are also multiple online support groups. This is something that I found very helpful for some of the clients that I've worked with. It's easy to share with another parent in the grocery store line that your child was homesick from camp or that your child, you know, um, I don't know, I can't think of what, the naughty things that little kids do, right? It's, it's easy to kind of chat with that and kind of bond over those challenges. But it's not comfortable, it's not easy to share, my child got caught cheating in college or my child got a DUI, or I've noticed that my kid now has three tattoos and those are what I can see. It's not easy to share that with your coworkers and office mates and the neighbor. So joining a support group, um, especially something that's online, might be more helpful um, so that you have a big group of people to help share that support. I mention an online support group because typically there's going to be a lot of people in that. Um, you know, it's pretty tough as well if you're the only one that your child has done all of these things and everyone else is having a breeze of a time. The last tip I would give is to leave things on a positive note when you actually drop your child off at college. And this also was a tough one for me. So as I envisioned my child going off to college and I've watched movies about parents and kids, you know, they, they just, you know, the next scene is the things are in the college room or they're down by the tree at the edge of the campus hugging and saying goodbye. 
I don't know very many movies that talk about the traffic and the construction and fighting over which way, whether you're gonna use Waze or Google Maps. And my kids always were on the fifth or sixth floor. This is Texas people, five or six floors in the dorm, having to haul that great big old comforter and rubber maids and going back for those little things, elevators jammed. It's not looking like a pretty movie scene by the time that we drop them off at college or drop them off in their dorm. I remember, um, <laughs> I remember helping my oldest son set up the dorm room. And remember, this was my first out of the three, so far, out of the four. So I really had a certain picture in my mind. And I was going to help him make his bed for the first time and help organize things and put his pens in a little pen cup on his desk and, you know, just help get everything set up for him. We talked about setting up his dorm a lot, or I talked about it a lot. And we made sure that we bought everything off that checklist and, and we had it in several rubber maids all prepared to go. As I'm unpacking his things for him, the sheets were some random sheet from my linen closet, not the set that we bought for him. So he's trying to go to school having a double or a queen size sheet on his twin bed. He just thought, oh, just grab this. I'm continuing to help unpack him. There is a knife from my knife block because he needs to have a sharp knife to cut apples. He doesn't like to bite the apples just straight. And then I saw the salt and pepper shaker from my kitchen table that he must have just grabbed on the way out. Oh yeah, last random thought, I might wanna have salt and pepper there. We'll just grab these. Take a breath. It's okay, it's not like the movies. But your parting words, the encouragement, that experience, it's a really, really special time. Think about what you want to say to your child. Maybe it's me being a little more sentimental, but I just really think that those words and that moment is going to stick with them. Give them a moment. Hug them. Meet their roommate. And make sure that that ending and uh, the bridge into the new life and the new experiences they're going to have is a really welcoming and happy one for them. Thank you. <clears throat> Carrie and I were, um, were, I know that this goes until 8.30, so Carrie and I were going to offer to take some time in answering any questions that anyone might have. Mike's on. Um, okay, so I'm not sure who to ask the question of, but I'll ask it. One of the things that I really struggled with when my kids got ready to go to school was they kind of came in and out of how responsible they were both with the financial aid, well really it was the financial aid was the biggest problem or the biggest challenge for us, but also the application process, keeping track of which school and so forth. Because about the time that I would think they had a handle on it, they'd just drop out and we'd miss a deadline. Can you talk a little bit more about how do you find that balance in, help, in, in letting them do what is their job and, and figuring out how much is supposed to be support versus control of the parent? Because while they're doing that, they're doing the soil nesting, as you called it, and they're getting mad that we're trying to step in too much. So if you could, if you could speak to that about how, how do you find that balance? That's a really good question. Um, in some of those tips that I gave before about that spreadsheet that was so excruciating to make, um, I had a very different view on the college application process than my child did, uh, one of my kids. For some reason, um, in his class, and I don't know if this is just super common, but it was like a real pride thing to say, oh, I got accepted by 12 different colleges. When I hear I got accepted by 12 different colleges, I'm thinking that you paid $75 to apply to 12 different colleges? 
uh-uh. So having that discussion about what colleges do you want to go to, what, you know, what does that class size look like, um, what are some things, you know, narrowing it down for a college trip. Um, maybe give, if you're able to, give them the option of being able to go check out the campuses of a couple different places. I often referred back to this spreadsheet. Um, and then on there, when are the deadlines? When, um, you know, honestly, my experience has been that um, most colleges, most of the larger colleges and public schools, they do allow late admission. And so even if your child hasn't applied until like March, and I'm even thinking about some particular clients that I'm currently working with, um, if you, they don't even apply until March, then they typically are still able to get in if they meet the requirements. Um, but I definitely, we had that discussion about um, how, many, how many colleges are you gonna apply to? I have an adopted daughter and she hasn't gone to college at all and she's 25 and I've just decided to let her make her decisions about it because she did do a credit in high school and she had a, a very high verbal IQ but her executive functioning was very lagging mm -hmm. so um, with procrastination and, and nagging on my part etc. Um, what I struggle with is as a um, single social worker was the financial risks you know that she would go to classes and and either not show up sometimes or drop out or not be going and then that semester would be lost you know and then the money that I'd saved for 20 years was gone you know mm -hmm. so what are your opinions about that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure which piece of what you said um, was your question, um, but I do think that absolutely um, college is not for everyone. Um, we can, many people make a, a wonderful life for themselves without college. It's not appropriate for everyone. Um, and I do think that we as um, role models and coaches for our children uh, need to be honest with ourselves and with them about what their aptitude is and also what the family resources are. So I affirm you for knowing that. I heard you mention that your child had already taken one class. So it's super important for kids to know that the very first college class that they take starts their college history, starts their transcripts. Every single one will follow from there. So there really isn't that learning curve that they can take and you know get a D on a class and a couple C's. You do that and you have a horrible GPA already. Um, you know, following up on what Carrie said about college isn't for everyone, very much agree with that. I also really think that um, that college isn't for everyone as soon as they graduate. So that son I was talking about that was grumbling about why do I even have to apply and go to college anyways and he was making ten dollars at the bowling alley well that next year he stopped going to college and that was super challenging for me because we still shared a joint bank account and I can see that he had seven dollars and thirteen cents in his account and it was very, very difficult to see my child struggle when I knew I could easily just transfer $100, but I had to let that happen. Um, that only took about six months. Now my 24-year-old is a paramedic and a firefighter. So they have to find that themselves. They have to be able, and 
is very hard for me because we as parents need to also remember that our kids are not a reflection of us. Our kids, their achievements and their struggles and challenges. We don't own them. That's their journey and we need to be careful not to take that on us. So um, another suggestion though, if she's not going to college, is looking at what type of a career she would want that doesn't require college. So if she's super artsy and craftsy, then maybe working at Michael's and um, working up and being able to have, a, be, have the role of a store manager, um, working in some sort of a job where there is growth. When you have a um, college age kid or a um, high school kid that is seems to be under motivated, in my experience, that is really difficult for parents. What do you suggest? What, what can you offer the parents in that situation? Hi, um, this is very tricky, and I think it's especially tricky for um, parents when the child has previously been motivated and then seems to sort of fall off a cliff in terms of motivation. Um, that can be very painful, and just um, part of what we have to do is notice the grief that things aren't on the path that we thought they were on. Um, it's very hard to negotiate changes when we think we've sort of steered the ship right and hopefully it will get all the way to shore and then it turns out that the sail is up or some other sailing metaphor that I don't know properly. Um, but I think one of the challenges we have as parents when our children are underfunctioning is figuring out how we can decrease our overfunctioning. Um, one of the big challenges is not becoming too anxious about what's happening, setting uh, reasonable expectations, figuring out what our leverage is. Um, if they have stopped attending school or doing their homework, are they still able to drive their car? Um, are they still able to have their part-time job, which gives them spending money to do fun things? And so figuring out what is the leverage, what's, what is something that's motivation, motivating, and also figuring out why have they stopped being motivated. Um, somewhere around fifth grade, one of my children uh, just stopped talking to us. Nothing was wrong with him, it's just that's the developmental stage of fifth graders, apparently. And it was very confusing to my husband and I because he had been a, a chatty child. He's a wonderful child, um, almost a young man. Don't tell him, I said. And um, so figuring out was that um, a feature of being 11 years old or was it a bug where something was wrong? And so knowing your own child, is something significant going on? Do they need to um, come and talk to a professional, a mental health counselor? Is it depression Is it, um, or is it simple lack of motivation? I tend not to think anything is simple, um, but figuring out is the lack of motivation a symptom or is it the problem can also help you figure out which way to chart your course. As we wait for the next question, I just want to say that my first degree was forestry. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> good evening, and thank you for the delivery. Uh, good stuff. Okay, so we got four boys at home. Uh, one soon to be 21, the other is 20. Um, 19, just turned 19, and one 17 year old. And it's crazy. It's, the house feels like a hotel restaurant. Right? Mm -hmm. um, stuff is everywhere when they have some kids coming over, staying overnight. It's just like a frigging tornado. Mm -hmm. So there's a part of me that doesn't want to address it, and part of me just wants to fully address it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the hard point here is finding that balance, and I think the word balance was mentioned. The other component is. Um, what are your thoughts on charging rent to kids who are working but not yet in college? Just, just a thought.
That's a really great question. I appreciate you sharing a little bit of the background there. Um, I think I would first look at what is your parenting style and how have you had your home structured up until now? So is it just something more recently that everything kind of becomes a disaster? Is that something, a skill or a value that you've instilled in them before in um, you know, monitoring things? Um, as silly as it sounds, we still use chore lists in my house. And we used a chore list until the kids, one of my kids, <coughs> attended the junior college while they were still living at home. Um, and even though I was trying very hard to be like, okay, you don't have to check in with me anymore. I won't count on you being at the dinner table unless you tell me. I was really trying to give him his space and freedom. I would get irate when I would come home and see boxes of cereal in the living room and his mess strewn throughout the house. So having, you know, continuing to talk to them, um, not letting the little things go. When they drop something, tell, you stand there, tell them to pick it up. Help them see what they need to do in the moment, using those teachable moments. As far as paying for rent, um, so I told my kids that they had to pay rent, and they had to pay rent through, they had to pay rent, but they had the option of paying rent through doing certain responsibilities around the house. So we came up with a list of things. Um, doing all of the landscaping and gardening. Um, you know, I, I can't even remember some of those things that they were doing, but you know, the sweeping and mopping, vacuuming the whole house, um, taking care of their space, cleaning up their own bathroom. Those were all things that were required that this was the house that I was paying the mortgage on. Um, they were in the space in my house reminding them they have the option of living in a different home or living in the dorms or living in an apartment. But if they're choosing to live at home, then these were the responsibilities and this is kind of how you're gonna pay rent. If you did not fulfill these responsibilities, then you would be paying rent instead. You'd be paying that through money rather than those chores. I do like that choice idea of you're welcome to live someplace else where they can charge you rent as well. Um, other questions uh, that y'all might have or any questions that come from home? Well, listen, we want to thank you all for attending tonight. Let's have a big round of applause for Carrie and Carrie. And we want to remind you that CEUs are available if you want to grab those or take care of those as you check out tonight. And then we'd remind you that next month we have August 17th is Doc, uh, Reverend and Dr. Paul Burns, uh, who will be talking on spiritual assessment and the role between attachment and greater spiritual health. So with that, uh, we'd like to thank you for tonight and wish you well. And on behalf of Unity Church, thank you for coming tonight. And I hope you make this a monthly outing. Yes. Yes. Good to see all of y'all tonight. Yeah, good Take to see care. you.